Hi, I'm Bob Ethington. And I'm Nick Nicholas. And this is From Akron and Beyond. So on this episode, uh, we are actually going to move into part two of an interview that we've been doing with a writer, a musician, home improvement specialist, (laughs) educator, David Giffels. Uh, He's been called the Bard of Akron by no less than the New York Times, and he has a lot of books. We we discussed in his first, um, in the first segment, uh, first episode with him, Basically, how he got into writing, uh, his early roots here in Akron, his early experience doing music, and then just kind of those young years, and then his moving into working for the Akron Beacon Journal in his career there. And so, at this point, it seemed like a good that seemed like a good place to stop, so we could begin our second uh, part of this episode. Um, really delving more into his uh, body of work, uh, uh, specifically with his books. And so, um, David, with that rather awkward introduction, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, then we we had talked about uh, the first book with your name on it, Wheels of Fortune, uh, that you'd worked with, with the Beacon Journal staff on. Um but then, am I correct that the next book that you that came out under your name was your book on Devo? Right. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about that. I know you wrote it with uh, Jade Dellinger, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, um, you know, Devo had sort of made a resurgence in the 1990s. And I was going to say, what year was that first edition of that or first? So version? that book came out um, uh, in 2003. Oh, okay. So. But it was around, you know, I had been a Devo fan all my life, sure. and I was in, and obviously connected with them through the Akron um, history theme. But also, um, they had sort of, they had played Lollapalooza in 1996, and they were kind of back sort of um, right. in, in their second act. Mm-hmm. And really, you know, all of the younger bands that had been influenced by them were paying them homage, but they were still a very vibrant musical force. and. Right. So I was writing about them, and I was, but and had the opportunity to interview them um, different times, and I was starting to think, you know, that there's a book that no, nobody had written a, a Devo biography, right? right. And so uh, I, I think it was 2000. The first of the devotional Devo conventions took place in Cleveland, mm-hmm. and I met this guy there from Tampa who had come up for the convention named Jay Dellinger, and we got to talking and hit it off immediately, and he's like. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of. I've been working on this Devo book, and I said, "Well, I kind of have been too." And in my in my competitive mind, it's like there's not room in this world for two Devo books. <laughs> and then Jade said, "You know, I've got all this research," and he said, "Like, but I don't know how to write it into a book." Mm. And I'm like, "Well, I don't love doing research, but I love to write." <laughs> so we had like this uh, connection, and and, right. it, and so we collaborated, and it was a full, like a true collaboration. We mm-hmm. um, and we. Um, had a, a an English publisher that um, kind of specialized in books about obs- kind of obscure art rock kind of mm-hmm. topics. So Devo fit into what they did. So they they published that book. It was under the title "Are We Not Men? We Are Devo," mm-hmm. um, taken from their first album, right? Uh, in two thousand three, and um, and it's still the only full definitive biography of the band, right? But I should take this opportunity to say that yes. um, that book has been out of print for a number of years. Mm-hmm. And we um, uh, connected with the University of Akron Press. I teach at the University of Akron. Right. So it was a, a good relationship already. Um, and the University of Akron Press is this year reissuing. Not It's not really a reissue. I'm calling it a 20th anniversary deluxe edition. It's okay. um it's under a new title with an entirely new presentation. It's the same basic story, but it's rewritten to focus on the Ohio years mm-hmm. right up until they become famous. Okay. Um, under the title, The Beginning Was the End, Devo in Ohio. Okay. Um, and so the main feature is that it's got um, nearly 100 never-before-seen be sort- never photographs oh, wow. and images. Um, Jade is a an um, art curator, and okay. so he is very... 
and and a heavy collector. Mm -hmm. um, he's, I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has a lot of his stuff okay. on display and in their archives. Um, and so we were able to tap into his archive to make this book a much more visual presentation. Mm -hmm. University of Akron has done a great job of creating it. Um, depending on when you're listening to this, it's coming out in October of 2023, which coincides with the 50th anniversary of Devo's. Wow first performance okay so i remember going yeah. to your actual book signing at, at square records yeah when that came out yeah it's like a million years i ago. know i know <laughs> yeah so we're, we're thrilled that it's going to be not only back in print but really a great presentation yeah um, as as a book so yeah right right and we will be doing a kickoff for that at the we Akron will. Main Library. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, depending on when you're listening to this, the the um, the big book launch event will be at the Akron Main Library. I would have it no other place. Um, <laughs> I've had the opportunity to launch um, my last four books there and have had great experiences. And I will be in conversation with Bob Ethington, our host here. Um, and Jade will be there too, right? And Jade, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, so Jade, my co-author, will be there right. as well. And so, yeah, so. I think the yeah. um, adding more photographs is an interesting idea to that book because um, obviously Devo comes from such an art background and such a visual. That, that was almost, I mean, that was kind of, I think an overwhelming a part of uh, overwhelming part of their original appeal was just how they looked and yeah. how they acted on stage yeah. to the point that I think that some of the innovations and true quirky genius of their music could get overlooked sometimes. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the thing that appeals to me about that band is, is, is everything that happened in Ohio, uh -huh. you know, because Devo was, you know, it, it, they really got started in 1972, and it was this sort of this wide-ranging conceptual art project mm -hmm. based on the notion that humans were evolving in reverse, d hence right. de-evolution. Right. Um, and and so they it were, seems prescient. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> if you true. listen to Jerry Casale, the co-founder <laughs> of the band, um, talk about. It. I mean, he's every decade he's said, "Well, we can see new evidence of." of de-evolution and he's absolutely right and it just seems <laughs> yeah. to yeah it's, it's frighteningly um true <laughs> and so yeah so they were you know they were very um interested in in visual art and visual mm -hmm. presentation and in experimentation with technology and right. different ways of 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 de-engineering what a rock band they weren't even a rock band really right, they didn't right. really become a true rock band until 1976 when Alan Myers joined them as a drummer and he just gave them this yeah. this punch, this kick that, right, right. that they hadn't had before. And that's when they... But to me, I mean, really, like, even though their first couple of albums, I think, are, are amazing and I love them, they, they, their story becomes much less interesting once they become VH1 behind the music, you know, mm -hmm. once they become right. famous and have a hit with Whip It. Right. Um, I mean, I'm you know, I, I love their story all the way through, but... This book focuses on that really fascinating, wide-ranging, yeah, idea, imagination-driven, just you know, just yeah. concoction. This big Rube Goldberg device of a of a band. <laughs> it's funny because um, it, it seems ridiculous now, but I remember. I mean, because I'm old, I remember very well when uh, the single of Satisfaction came out. Um, and which, of course, is uh, their uh, mutated version of the Rolling Stones classic hit. And, um, oh, I knew a lot of people who were, they were actually offended by that song. Yeah, me too. I mean, do you write, Nick? Do you yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was almost like it was like sacrilege. Yeah. How dare yeah. they do that to that song, you know? And it's just... I mean, it's funny now to think about that. But Nick, without getting too far off the path, because we want to stick with David and his writing, but I just I have to ask you: with the Bizarros, did you must have had some sort of overlap with Devo back in those days? Well, more so, like uh, you know, with, I had Clone Records, mm -hmm. and there was a big interest in the first Devo single. Okay, and I would buy him from Mar meet Mark at his apartment and and get a you know a couple hundred and send him to Holland. You know, so you helped but, distribute that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, uh, other mm -hmm. than that, and then uh, we talked on the phone about doing some gigs together, but that, that was about it. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, uh, when Mark was in town a few years ago uh, for his art exhibition, 
uh, I had a chance to talk to him. I, you know, I, I, I bought David's book years ago, but didn't read it till like, you know, seven or eight years later. <laughs> and then it was pretty fresh in my mind when I was talking to Mark about it and asking him some specific questions. And he said, hey, you know, if all four members of Devo would write a book, each one would be totally different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I mean, we, the book starts with this concept of plastic reality that they, yeah. the, the idea that, you know, um, reality is manufactured and, and they're, yeah, they're all good yeah. sort of makers of their own myth and, and also breakers of their own myth. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, it's a fascinating group of individuals mm-hmm. and, you know, it's one of those, you know, the, the new, I, I wrote a new introduction and I, um, and the new introduction sort of addresses this question of, of it's it, it's easy to say that Devo couldn't have happened anywhere except Akron, mm-hmm. and then I kind of deconstruct that question and <laughs> and come to the conclusion that it, it it of course it's possible that it could have happened somewhere else, but it didn't. Right. And, right. And because it did, it's this crisscross of this industrial backdrop that they lived in, this crisscross of happening to be at Kent State when Kent State was like sort of the this this cultural anomaly in the middle of what was then a midwestern wasteland right. it was the it was this place between New York and Chicago that somehow drew all these intellectuals and poets and artists as visiting professors who were there to influence them right the galvanizing moment of the May 4th shootings that they were all either yes, present yeah. at or or directly impacted by mm-hmm. um, just this this um, you know I think of it almost as this snowflake that 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 they were at the center of that just branched out in all of these directions but right. it had to be from here because yeah. of the elements that that became in their band you know like where else could you have gone to the industrial supply store to buy those yellow oh, suits yeah. for, <laughs> right, for right. cheap <laughs> yeah you know, things like that that you know that just became sort of like what they were right. And so it's in that way, it's very much a story about place because Mm -hmm. because it would have been different if it happened somewhere else. I can't say it couldn't have happened somewhere else, but but it happened here and it touches so many larger parts of what life and culture and society and and um, individuality were in Akron, Ohio in the 1970s. Yeah. And, you know, the proof of what you're talking about is that, um, as you say, it, it. could have happened somewhere else maybe but it it didn't it happened here and more to the point a lot of times when there's a big cultural shift in in art you know let's just say like uh an obvious one that's coming to mind would be like punk rock you know um well punk rock has like certain uh, obviously a history but it's a history that is not really one place it's it was something that was happening in several different places right it was a cultural change that that just you know it was in the ground so to speak yeah. whereas there was no one else doing anything like what those guys were yeah. coming up with conceptually you know there's no oh these guys were kind of like devo in london no, i mean uh, no yeah. not really right yeah and you know some of that is you know when, when you talk about place you also have to be talking about time mm-hmm. and in a place like ohio pre-internet uh, you know, where it like it wasn't a cultural wasteland, but it was much harder to get cultural information. Right. And, you know, nobody cared what an underground band was doing. You know, right. if you formed a band in New York City, you had to basically, you know, be live the next day on stage, you know, to to play. There there, were, there aren't garages and barns and places to <laughs> right, just right. just make yeah. music and, and figure yeah. out what the hell you're doing. Yeah. So, a couple hundred bucks for one night rehearsal space, right? And hope, yeah, that, you're, hope yeah. that you're good at tight enough to play the next gig, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like, you know, Devo, for better or for worse, were completely ignored for enough years that they were able to really figure it really kind of sort of gestate what they were about. Mm-hmm. And that wouldn't have happened in another place. So just yeah. just right. the, the, the benefit of being ignored suddenly right. su- like, like sort of strikes you as like part of what it was to be a band in, in Ohio in that yeah. in that time. <laughs> And we did have Perubu in Cleveland too. Yeah, you know, that, that that sort of needs to be addressed at yeah. some point. 
Right. I mean, there's a slight overlap there, but not with the visual element that Devo had. I yeah. Don't think. Well, they were, I, you know, they're, that dynamic is really interesting because David Thomas yeah. of Per Ubu mm -hmm. likes to talk about the, the Devo Per Ubu overlap. And, yeah. you know, he says, you know, Devo was a pop band and Per Ubu was a folk band. Like we were <laughs> of the people and they were sort of of this sort of slick presentation. And, um, but they were doing the same thing. They were yeah. both making art rock mm -hmm. that didn't sound really like anything right. that had right. come before. Yeah, I mean, both are unique yeah. in Ohio bands. Yeah. You know? Right. And right. also both like driven by very ambitious and in some ways ruthless people, which is <laughs> necessary. But you yeah, know, I mean yeah. that's part of yeah, that's that's part of it. You know, like I mean Jerry Casale and Mark Mothersbaugh as the sort of the dual front of Devo is such an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's a very like Lennon and McCartney, very different people right. who needed each other for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Jerry was ambitious and unafraid and mm -hmm. bold yeah. and Mark was arty and, and mm -hmm. weird and <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and you just, uh, again, like that, that chance meeting, you know, cause Mark wasn't part of it at the beginning. Right. Right. Um, and, and for him to kind of find his way into it, was really like the first important catalyst and to me the second and final important catalyst was alan myers joining as a drummer which pulled them they had been experimenting with electronic drums and you know like dissonant sounds mechanical sounds and playing around and then he comes in and he's this tight like any musician who hears that satisfaction cover mm -hmm. and tries to break down how that drum part works mm -hmm. just like that guy not only was a genius, but had to be like not just ambidextrous, but like tri ambidextrous. Yeah, because it's a backward reggae. Beat. Right, it's so weird. Right, yeah. And the guitar part too. Bob too. Bob mm -hmm. Casale played, uh -huh. pl wrote the main guitar riff for that. Mm -hmm. And it's you have to think backwards to play it. It's, <laughs> right, it's right. But it doesn't sound gimmicky. It doesn't. Right. I mean, <laughs> to the it, it sounds the way it's supposed to sound, but right. it's so yeah. Well, yeah, Different. well, Alan Myers, uh, I mean, as a, I, as a drummer myself, I mean, I just, his, his drumming is just incredible on that album. I've always, to me, that the first album by them has always been, for me, their highlight, and it's basically because he's on it. Yeah. You know, once you're, I mean, as they got later in their career, they went more to, like drum machines and you know computerized rhythms and stuff yeah. and and you know that's fine and that was part of their sound but yeah i missed the actual you know analog drums yeah. on that yeah. and how amazingly precise he yeah. played it was yeah, crazy exactly but, but also with just real kick mm-hmm mm-hmm After that book, now at, at this point, you get a contract to put out a book under your own name on a on a big publisher. Yeah. Now, what book is that? I, I, I I'm getting confused if it's all the way home so or that's if it's all hard the way. way. Home. It yeah. is all the way home. I yeah. thought okay, I couldn't remember the order of those two, of, of the next two we're going to talk about. Um, so all the way home, building a family in a falling down house uh, gets. Uh, a great response. I mean, terrific reviews. Uh, and um, uh, the whole story behind it is, is great. And I, I, I'm going to guess that a lot of our listeners are familiar with the book, but uh, give us a sort of a brief synopsis of, of the story because it's an important part of your personal story as well, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, mm -hmm. in, um, so right at the same time th that we talked about before, where I was just beginning my career at the Beacon Journal, mm -hmm. um, just beginning our family, just sort of like leaving like sort of my youthful <clears throat> musical pursuits behind, just sort of that transitional moment. Um, my wife and I were, she was pregnant with our second child. And so we were in that sort of 
practical position that some young families are in where we needed another bedroom because mm-hmm. our family was about to start growing. Right. We had one a, a one-year-old son at the time. Mm-hmm. And so we started sort of casually but um, seriously house hunting. Right. And we made the mistake of going on one of the Tour of Gracious Living um, tours that <laughs> yeah. we put on and seeing all these fantastic old Tudor houses that right. just – captured our imagination sure. but knowing that we didn't have the means by yeah. far to live mm-hmm. in a place like that and um somewhere in that process we stumbled upon this beyond decrepit old tudor m- manse uh, <laughs> in, in the highland square area um that was equal parts um unbelievable decay you know, j- huge holes in the roof overcome with raccoons and bats and <laughs> Um, and rot yeah. and decay and a hoarder house, but also six fireplaces and stained glass windows and a pond with a waterfall and a yeah. billiards room and just yeah. just this mashup of 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 rot and grandeur, <laughs> and we just became smitten and yeah. somehow through a series of uh, of romantic. Uh, stupidity and <laughs> and dumb s- missteps of fate. We found ourselves owning it <laughs> and moving in with um, with only ourselves to right. try to save ourselves from this decision. And so that so that book is a memoir of the first year of trying to, and as the subtitle says, um, building a family mm-hmm. in a falling down house. So right, trying right. to form ourselves as a family. It's also you know like. I wrote that book 10 years after that first year. So I had the ability to kind of recognize how it played into some of what we were talking about before. Um, you know, I was working on, or we were doing that the first year of that project. At the same time, I was working on the Wheels of Fortune project. Mm. So I was very, very aware of what it meant to be living in a house that had been built during the height of Akron's power, yeah. economic and social and cultural um and and power of identity right um and and for it to fall into the hands of of a, a family with very very little means mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but also the privilege and responsibility of being able to save it right you know right. i mean the the beauty of this house to us was that while every single thing in it was broken or wrong nothing in it had been virtually nothing had been changed from the time it was built so you could see the possibility of what it was supposed to be right um against the backdrop of decay which is the story of any rust belt city right, right so right right, um, right so that became like sort of our narrative um mm-hmm. by accident yeah <laughs> but then stories put stories put order back to the chaos of real life and you know <laughs> and that's what that story was about right um, yeah, I mean, that, I, I love the book because it is it. it, it I mean, you just really delineated it, uh, David. It, it's like a very personal story, yeah. but it also is so reflective of this whole city and yes, and uh, you know bigger realities or or yeah. uh, wider wider realities. So yeah, it's it's really great. And as we are uh, recording this podcast, we are in the middle of a when well we aren't. I'm not, but there is a <laughs> a writer strike and a uh, actor strike going on in Hollywood and in the world of uh, creating content and entertainment. But um, this story has been reported, so I figure I can we can talk about it for a bit. The rights to All the Way Home have been purchased, right? To uh, yeah. be a TV series. Yeah, I would <laughs> really? want to put yeah. that into context. Yeah, it was um, it was optioned by a producer, and actually in. 2021 so mm-hmm. um yeah and it's i i wouldn't want to make too much of that it's yeah uh, unlikely at this point that it will turn into a tv series right but by the same token that's the case when, for anything that gets bought though right yeah Any but right, when they yeah. opt this producer optioned it in tandem with a, he's in new york and he had a a right writer director um on board in mm-hmm. la and in our first meetings, they said, you can be as much part of this project or as little part of, as you want. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm a, I'll be as much as I can. Yeah, sure. So I got, I, I, learned, I got a free education in 
telev- how television works. It's much different than the publishing world <laughs> at the it's at the business end and even at the artistic end. Um, and learned how to write a pilot, learned how to write a treatment for a show. I, Interesting. You know, and wow. so we went through this whole process, and then um, once it went out to the networks, it just didn't didn't go. I mean, it's still an active yeah. possibility, but I would say at this point, I wouldn't count on right. that show becoming a show. Yeah. Well, I mean... That's yeah. great news. I, I yeah. have no clue. Plus, well, and plus you get, when you sell the option, you get some money, correct? Uh, not really. Yeah, okay. No. All I right. mean, <laughs> yeah. So my, my son's a... He works for Magnolia Films in New York and... Uh, it's happened to him on several occasions, you know, like not, not for TV series, but options for, you know, for ideas he had for films. I think for a couple of them, he got like fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. as an upfront thing. Yeah, I mean, typically, if something gets optioned, it's more an agreement that we will take this out into the marketplace. And so, like when my agent, when my agent and I talked about this, he said he's like, you could ask them for you know such and such amount of money, which wasn't that much money. Mm-hmm. But he said then you're setting yourself up in a sort of a business relationship, which is a transactional. Or if you, he knew that I was interested in sort of being part of it creatively. Right. He said, you're much better off just being a creative partner, and then if anything happens, that's where the money's right. going to be. Right, so right, so right. if you want to get your check up front, yeah. you're, you're sort of, yeah. So yeah. Um, anyway, that was, yeah, like, yeah, that that was part of, one small part of my education in the television industry. Well, it should be mentioned, and I'm not sure if you know this, Nick, or not, but... Um, or if our audience, for that matter, knows this, but uh, you were at one point a writer for Beavis and Butthead. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not full time and not mm-hmm. um, by of, of any great consequence, but yes, I wrote a number of a, a handful of uh-huh. uh, episodes of the initial series and a little small piece of the yeah the first feature film Beavis and Butthead Do America. Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's that thing that was. It's always sort of like been on my my uh-huh. resume. Yeah, it's a good, and, it's a nice little thing in your resume. I, I know, think, yeah. but I feel like you know, like I wrote my like my big personal story and all the way home, and you know, like a, I had this journalism career that I'm proud. Of, but that's what everybody wants to talk about is. Beavis <laughs> and <laughs> well, we'll let it go at yeah, that for a, now. That's cool. This is from Akron and Beyond. I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host Nick Nicholas, and our guest is. Writer, educator, journalist, et cetera, et cetera, David Giffels. So um, so that book is published to a lot of acclaim, and you followed that up with, it was now, again, I'm embarrassed by this because I have all these books, Same I've read all these books, but I'm kind of getting confused on the order of them. So, so but, The Hard Way on Purpose, the hard way on purpose next. is yeah. next. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. That, And those were the two I was a little confused about. Okay, so... Um, the Hard Way on Purpose, I think, has become a signature work of yours. Uh, that phrase, I mean, has become kind of part of the local lexicon, if not beyond. And um, uh, and it's is it's a, a collection of essays. Well, I'll let you describe it, David. What was your approach when yeah? Coming so up with that um, book? so I started working on the next book. It was a completely different topic, um, but as I was writing, so what happened is. I, uh, all the way home, did well enough that um, the Beacon Journal was offering buyouts, and I knew just business-wise that things were trending in a bad direction, and I'm halfway through a career that I didn't see um, myself surviving the second half of in a way that I wanted to live and and work. And so, so I had the opportunity to take a buyout from the Beacon Journal and I approached the University of Akron about um, about teaching creative in their creative writing program mm-hmm. and they liked the idea and so um, and so I was able to uh, to get hired by the uh, by the University of Akron mm-hmm. um, as an English professor and leave the Beacon Journal and take a year off in between mm. and so I started working on this next book um, and I was writing, I was trying to write one book and all of these stories about coming of age in the Rust Belt just kept coming into what I was writing. And so, and so it just, it, it was like that just felt like the story that was there that I felt like I could tell Mm -hmm. because I'm of the first generation born in the 1960s, the first generation 
to come of age in Akron or in any industrial or post-industrial hometown mm -hmm. um, that never knew the the heyday, never knew right. what Nick described before as the smell of industry and, <laughs> and the experience of the working people. Um, we knew the decline. You know, by the time I was exploring downtown Akron, downtown was this sort of abandoned, yes, desolate. Right. Mm -hmm. But fascinating, mm -hmm. you know, to me, playground of right. of decay and possibility. Yeah, and obviously, as I've proven, I'm drawn to decayed things <laughs> that are full of romantic possibility. So that's my problem. Um, yeah. So so the so the the book became a collection of essays about mm -hmm. that experience and and trying to put some meaning to that experience of of doing things the hard way on purpose. I think that that. I, you and I, David, and I have talked about this before, but my father worked for Goodyear, and um, uh, we, um, uh, we've Nick and I have talked on the show before about how he's uh, like you, a lifelong Akronite, and I uh, am I'm not. I moved here in 1974 with my family. I was a kid, and um, we we were transferred all the time because my father's great ambition was to move up in Goodyear, and I think he probably was hoping to maybe make vice president. Yeah. Never quite made it there, but he had a very, very successful career. But part of, in those days, if you wanted to move up that corporate ladder, I don't know, think it's the same way now but because of, oh, I don't know, computers and <laughs> the internet and yeah. cell phones or whatever. But in those days, you had to actually get up and physically move. And so I kind of lived in a lot of different like subdivisions that were always filled with people that were in the same boat. They were working for all these different yeah. companies mm -hmm. and they'd live there and we, we'd be there for a year or maybe two years and then we would move somewhere else. And in my case, it was all pretty much moving up and down the Midwest from Michigan to Texas. But anyway, my point here is, is that Akron was always my father's mecca. I am probably, I think, I th when I tell people from Akron this, they always are their jaws drop. But yeah. we came to Akron on vacation. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, on, I mean, and went to the the rubber museum and went to the blimp hangar and you know and, and I remember my father showing us the diamond grill and he was like that's where all the big shots eat <laughs> and when the golfers yeah. come in that's where they all go and they have the best steaks yeah. and you know all this and it was just it was. Um, uh, so it's funny to me because it's like in the well, by the time we moved here in seventy four, uh, there was still the smell of the rubber plants. It was still that was still there, but um, boy, it was on the precipice. Yeah, and and you know the the, the decline was quick. Yeah, you know, and the, it's just funny. Yeah. It's just funny though to think about. I mean, because as you were talking about having grown up here when you did, and right. it was kind of like I my dad was somebody who was heading here with this vision of the yeah. Akron of it at its greatest prosperity. Well, you may remember this when we did the book launch for that book mm -hmm. um, at the main library. So it's a auditorium full of Akronites. Yeah. And I said at the beginning or early in that talk, I said, I said, you know, that thing that we say when somebody tells us they moved here from so somewhere else. And I paused and the entire audience as one said the word, why? <laughs> Everybody knew the answer immediately, and yeah, right. uh, it, 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 because it, that's just that's part of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not. I mean, it's it's easy. It's it's reductive to say that's an inferiority complex. It's um, it's. I think the question is really to me like, how did you know it was good here? Because mm -hmm. we know it, but most people don't, or most people don't think of that first. Right. Um, and, and, Instead of like, why would you possibly want to do that? Right. And right. so um, I felt like that book was my opportunity to sort of tap into those shared um, experiences and instincts, mm -hmm. not just Akron, but like I very much like was trying to write that book outward to mm -hmm. say this is a version of a place that exists all across the middle America. Right. Um, right. Places that once were... Um, Easy, easily confident because of what the industrial era had done and now have lost that and f have to find right. who they are, their, their identity, but also to maintain um, a shared experience, not just to disintegrate, but to 
reinvent. Right. And that's what places like Akron are so good at doing. Yeah, I mean, we this has come up before on our on our show, but uh, you know, I do think people tend to overlook the resilience of Akron, and um, as I as, as I said earlier, that Akron sort of maintains. I mean, somehow uh, this place remains a you know overall very pleasant place to be and to yeah. live. And you know, uh, I recently went on a big road trip out west, and of course, the west is a whole different animal. But you know, to get there, you go through a lot of the Midwest and stuff. And boy, you know, if if you if you want to thumb your nose at Akron, move to Gary, Indiana, and see how that place yeah, is. A lot of empty buildings. <laughs> a lot, a lot yeah. of emptiness yeah. and a lot of... of uh, 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 It's just, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not trying to knock any particular town here, but it's just, it, it is amazing how sustainable Akron has been, yeah. you know. You know. One, you know, one of the things that that book gave me the opportunity to do was to visit a lot of other places, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, giving talks and readings and... Yeah. And... And to see so many other places that have had this experience and in almost every case to see this committed group of younger people yeah. who were embracing their mm-hmm. downtown and, and their neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, like Wheeling, West Virginia, I got invited back a few times to because I just really bonded with this group of younger, you know, sort of um, civic minded people who were like actively trying to make Wheeling better and Mm -hmm. and wheeling is filled with cool architecture and Mm -hmm. just you know just the kind of authenticity that that those kinds of towns have that need to be you know not just saved but championed right you know dave one thing uh, that's changed since uh, since you wrote the book there's actually i think almost a thousand people living in downtown akron now yeah Remember that that wasn't the yeah. case when when you wrote the book. No. Yeah. Oh, oh well, yeah, okay, and particularly back now in the seventies and well, eight, early eighties, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to get to that part about the underground tunnels at Goodrich and and the well, events that. Yeah, there's a there's yeah. a there's a sequence of essays in the middle of that book that are sort of connected about um, about all of that ex- downtown exploration because you know again in the nineteen eighties I was at the University of Akron and so I'm really exploring my the center of the city for the first time. And my friend John Puglia and I it was like a great, like sort of, um, sort of, like he had great vision about downtown and he sort of took me along on his adventures exploring along the canal at night and <laughs> all this stuff. And in fact, you talk about living downtown. He um, turned an empty space above the Diamond Deli into his apartment at one point and was mm. living up there and he was the only other person living downtown was the photographer Bruce Gates who had um who occupied another upstairs you know loft space mm-hmm. it in sounds so romantic hotel. it was just like <laughs> there was nobody else down there yeah yeah, 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 yeah in the residence of the Mayflower Hotel the yeah. flop house yeah so um so but John had this great vision and also he was just um he got things done and so he so at the time after the B.F. Goodrich complex had been abandoned by Uniroyal, who had pulled up roots, and this is in the 90s, um, and they were trying to figure out what to do with all that space. John approached the owners and said, hey, I can I use some of those empty spaces for a gallery, for an art gallery? And so they gave him access to some of the some of the complex, and he opened up a trio of connected galleries. One was in a stairwell, one's in a little what had been the shoe shop where they where the workers went and got their their work shoes um, just a little like you know hut and then another you know sort of more gallery-ish space um completely raw industrial space um just left as it had been when the workers left the line with this i mean if you can't feel the spirit of history coming from walls like those those mm-hmm. brick walls with dirty brick walls <laughs> then you can't so yeah so by virtue of that we got further into the complex and there were these underground tunnels where they used to run materials from mm. one building to another and um and we, we and so i entered this like sort of hg wells <laughs> science fiction landscape this underground landscape of dark corners and dripping water off in the corners and um, but also, like, we'd come out of the tunnel into another 
factory space mm. where you'd find like a workstation where somebody had been building tires or doing whatever and there'd still be like their family photo tacked to the wall mm, wow. or like you know like a pair of gloves or a work order like this human residue yeah. in these completely post-industrial abandoned spaces that was just like filled with story i mean that's yeah. why i felt I, I think the book i was trying to write couldn't overcome what i was experiencing by then mm. um that that just you know like couldn't not be written because it was just so rich and compelling yeah. and yeah so you know i'm glad in that way that i had the opportunity to experience that downtown without like we didn't have any awareness of what this of the crisis that this represented to Akron. Mm -hmm. um, we just had this sense of, I used the word playground before, of this like yeah. post-apocalyptic playground that we didn't see as ruined. We saw it as like, like literally like you could put a gallery in there and then John mm -hmm. did and another uh -huh. friend was like, I could open like a little, like like a, you know, a resale shop and somebody mm -hmm. did that for a while and you know, somebody opened up a record store and, you know, things that, 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 people of our age would want mm -hmm. and nobody else wanted that space. It's right. just like this match made in hell. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in the late 70s driving to the flats before they were turned into what they are now you know playing with perubu and just these big huge you know 80 foot piles of of junk or whatever yeah. it was it could have yeah. been scrap metal it could have been you know sand but it was yeah the, you know same i thing. love hearing david thomas from perubu talk about because they came of age playing the flats at the pirate Co yeah well, pirates Cove. Yeah, we played with them on several thursdays yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing, and he just like he captured like he really he's like that's the real Cleveland, you know. Yeah. But Bob, you know, like going full circle. <laughs> when I was underage, sneaking into the bank to mm -hmm. see Unit Five, yeah, you know that that experience. I'm not that much younger than you, but that, right. that but yeah. when you're young, you know, the difference between sure. 17 and 21 is <laughs> right, right. Um, you know that that that's the perfect image of you know mm -hmm. the the bank this this symbol of yeah. of the establishment of right. opulence this uh, you know this mahogany walled right building that has fallen into the hands of the young creative people who right. make it into a punk rock club and right. Right. you know and and that was that I mean that experience of sneaking into the bank mm -hmm. like sneaking in like it was yeah. so hard to get in yeah. underage <laughs> yeah the money you get in. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. um and then seeing you know my first live rock and roll mm -hmm. is like has influenced my entire life since then, right you know right yeah you know that is the you know we've discussed that earlier in the earlier episode but but yeah the the one of the things that was so great about the bank so memorable about it was just that yeah these young punky new wave bands playing in a place that was kind of falling apart but that nonetheless had these remnants of its past opulence yeah you know and and just these velvet curtains and yeah. the big you know uh, the president of the bank's office yeah. that was where we'd hang out right. you know and yeah. the the plush chairs and stuff were all still there you know yeah. and so um yeah it was it was uh, I mean, yeah, very memorable. <laughs> I write this story. I have this distinct memory of one night my brother and I went to the bank. It was a winter night, and we drove downtown and parked <clears throat> across the street, went in, and w we had left our tire tracks in the snow. And when we came back out, we looked, and the only tire tracks in the snow were ours. And uh. then we followed them back home, and it's like this brigadoon, like sort of like <laughs> it only existed for that one night and only for us. And you know, like it's just like this special right. privacy within a very public space. <laughs> this is from Akron and Beyond. I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host Nick Nicholas, and we are talking with writer David Giffels. So we it occurs to me that we were kind of doing a fairly good chronological tour of your career and uh i think we still are pretty much on track basically we uh 
took you from all the way home into the understanding that like your career at the Beacon Journal was probably uh, coming to an end just because of the nature of the whole business of what was happening in journalism. And, um, and then uh, you have the hard way on purpose and that it kind of is your bridge into the academic life. You come out of the sabbatical of writing that correct into becoming a professor at the yeah. university of Akron teaching creative nonfiction. Am I cre- creative? That? Yeah, that's okay. my primary specialization. Okay. Yeah. And so um, the next book that you end up publishing then is furnishing eternity. Yeah. And um, that is another uh, extremely personal memoir on your part. Uh, and, very well written. Anyone out there who has not read that book, I highly recommend it because it's a, a real pleasure. Um, I guess I'll ask you just sort of talk about that book yeah, a little bit. I feel like we're doing the annotated bibliography. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so right. next, next, or um, this is your life. Yeah, right. You? <laughs> Remember that um, show. Too young for that. Yeah, that. So, um, Furnishing Eternity was this uh, sort of harebrained idea that as I write about in the book, I um, just sort of kind of through a couple of different factors, but just kind of like tossed out to my dad one night at a family party. I was like, you know, I bet we could, you know, my wife and I had been having this sort of like sort of um, quasi debate about burial. And she's okay. from a very traditional Sicilian Catholic mm-hmm family and and so a, a funeral is done a certain way and you buy an expensive casket and mm. and I'm like no I if when I die you could just put me in a cardboard box and throw me out behind the mall or something and so we so we would go on and have this banter about it and one night we're talking my dad was um a really fine woodworker mm-hmm. and I'm I'm like you know we we could build a coffin mm-hmm. and he's like you know, my dad was game for anything. And so, <laughs> so it was just so really like sort of this whimsical idea that we should build my coffin. And then that would sort of solve all these problems that weren't really problems. Yeah. You know, like right. you, you, you don't really, your coffin really not your problem right. <laughs> unless you make it your right. problem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we, so we ca- sort of did it. And, mm. and it, and so I was approaching the age of 50 and in my mind, it soon became a writing project idea mm-hmm. and i thought this would be the opportunity for me to cite, like write about the big themes yeah. of mortality and death right. you know and thinking about age and so people you'd lost in your life well i ha- i hadn't yet okay. so i hadn't really come face to face with mm-hmm. the the sort of the stunner of a loss right, right. and so you know like any foolish um still young <laughs> Under fifty, I consider young now. Well, yeah, um, right. You know, I, I was dabbling with the topic of death mm-hmm. through this overt symbolism of building my own casket. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and don't you know, writers out there, don't ever tempt the f- writing gods, um, <laughs> who will come back at you hard. Right. And so I'm in the middle of w- working on this, cons- this this carpentry project with my dad. Um, thinking about the theme of death, and then you know suddenly um and mostly unexpectedly, my mother died uh, mm-hmm. and so I knew I was going to have to write about that, so sure. suddenly this takes the turn from the the hypothet- the theoretical to the real right, and I had to sort of it's you know like writing through grief is very, very difficult because grief mm-hmm. is chaos and right. and writing is trying to put order to chaos and mm-hmm. it was and so I was writing through raw grief while I'm experiencing it. Yeah. And then um, as that's sort of starting to find its way, then my best friend, John Puglia, who I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. um, got cancer and died short mm-hmm. of his 50th birthday. So, yeah. so now I'm writing about turning 50 in the book <laughs> right. under the presence of the loss of my friend who didn't make it to 50. Right. And so right. this, this whole book that was like, uh, you know, I'm dabbling with the the writerly theme of death Mm -hmm. now i'm like buried in it so the book became a much different book than i thought it would be and ironically my and my dad plus the real reason behind that book initially was i just wanted an excuse 
a to spend time in my dad's workshop with him, which has always been had been my one of my favorite places to be, just mm-hmm. learning from him and and being in his dust and yeah yeah and and also to write about him because he was somebody I felt like I hadn't really he'd been in my other stories but not with the presence I wanted to have mm-hmm. and so he's you know the the main character I guess yeah. uh, throughout this book yeah and the book came out on. Uh, like January third of two thousand eighteen, and he mm. died mm. three days later. Yeah. So it, I mean, the the paperback has a, a final chapter right. that wasn't in the original hardback oh. release that mm-hmm. is about that. But um, just again, this idea that, um, you know, as you reach a certain point in your life, mm-hmm. the things that you think about as as you know, sort of. Um, ideas start to become realities and you right. start to deal with things in a different way. And I hope I'm not making this sound like a sad book because I it's not. feel it's like not. it's... Well, no, um, that was exactly what I was going to tag on uh, to what you were saying was that the book is uh, uh, has a lot of lightness to it and a lot of uh, funny stuff in it as well as dealing with these uh, more uh, heavy, if you will, themes. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was a... a Terrific achievement on your part. Uh, Very well done. Thank you. Yeah. So the latest book that you've published is Barnstone Ring, Ohio. And um, that book was a book of you really going out and reporting uh, about uh, sort of moving more into a political realm, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 So it's funny because uh, cause the, the New York Times review of – Furnishing Eternity used that phrase, the Bard of Ohio, uh-huh. or the Bard of Akron, uh-huh. and um, which I was, I mean, I, I'm proud of writing about my hometown, and it's and it's given me great material. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also felt like when when I read that, I, I'm like, I think I'm I'm being tight. I've typecast Time myself. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I and I felt like I had just kind of like played out this whole theme of place and mm. um, didn't have anything left to say about it. And so I had this idea for. Another book, again, like a completely different project that was going to be something very different than anything I had done before. Mm-hmm. And I spent a year writing the proposal, book proposal for that project. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was the best book proposal I had ever written. Mm-hmm. My agent really liked it. He took it out to 28 publishers <laughs> and <laughs> we got 28 rejections. Wow. And so, you know, like, so my soul was crushed and <laughs> yeah. I licked my wounds and then we regrouped. And this was in, um, this was in late, what, 2018. Mm-hmm. And I, I had another meeting with my agent and he's like, well, I, I'm like, what are we going to do now? So he's like, well, you know, everybody, the midterms had just happened. Mm-hmm. The tw- and so he's like, it, it just seems like Ohio is at the, con- no matter what, at the middle of this conversation mm-hmm. about the political winds, about the where we're headed as people. Right. It just seems like Ohio is w- the, where that story is told. Right. Um, and so he's like, um, why don't you write a book about Ohio you know, leading up to what we already knew was going to be a 2020 election that was going to be mm-hmm. historic. Um, and I'm like, yeah, but I just, I thought I was getting away from Ohio. <laughs> and then my agent said the magic words to a competitive person like me. He said, mm-hmm. well, David, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Uh. <laughs> and I said, well, then. <laughs> so it was on. So, yeah, so that book is, um, I spent a, a whole year, I spent mm-hmm. all of 2019 and into early 2020 traveling around Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget, I tallied up the mileage, but it was, uh, you know, well over a thousand miles. I mean, I mm-hmm. just, just meeting, just talk, meeting people, going places, trying to find the representations of the national concerns and and um, and the national conflicts in individuals in Ohio, mm-hmm. um, and kind of like what I was saying about Devo earlier, this idea that um, they could only have happened here. Mm-hmm. I felt like I felt like this was a place that quintessentially has always been able to tell the national story, um, partly just 
because of the spirit of the place, but also, I mean, it's been quantified that Ohio breaks down culturally around w- through five regions that very much represent the larger blanket of the right. American experience. That right. Where we live in Northeast Ohio is much like the Northeast mm-hmm. United States. Cincinnati region is much more like the South. Mm-hmm. Appalachia is much like the poor South. Right. Um, uh, Northwest Ohio is much more the true Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 Columbus is more like Phoenix than it is like Ohio. <laughs> so we uh, so we were operated under that premise. So yeah. So I wrote this book leading up to the 2020 election. Um, you know, you you go into a project and you don't exactly know what the ending would be. Right. And I always tell my students, what's bad for life is good for writing. Uh-huh. So the pandemic <laughs> broke oh, as I was on deadline. <laughs> like the right. chapter, the final chapter of the book was written in real time as the mm-hmm. pandemic was breaking, which again, you know, Ohio had this strange um, sort of centrality to that at the very beginning of it, because mm-hmm. Everyone else was scrambling, of course, what to do and right. how to address it. And it's this huge public health crisis. Right. And Mike DeWine, if you remember, and Amy Acton were being mm-hmm. looked to nationally as, yeah. as models of how to adapt. Right. And Proactive, it wasn't just by chance. It was because Ohio had been dealing with the opioid pandemic for right. a number of years and had learned how to align services, government services, mm-hmm. social services, um, uh, emergency services to address a health crisis that they were able to sort of transpose that model right. to how we were adapting quickly, much more quickly than anyone else yeah. to, to COVID. Um, w- people, there was massive job loss. People were yeah. uh, being put out of jobs. If you want to learn how to deal with massive job loss, come to Ohio. <laughs> right. We've been dealing with it for genera- two generations. Exactly. You know, these, these things that were about us mm-hmm. that, you know, again, like sort of like reinforce my this notion of the book that we tell the story uniquely, and so, yeah, so that's what, yeah, came out of it. Well, it's it, something I found interesting about it was that you know the book seemed, you know, as you said, it was sort of timed around the election, uh, and you know, books of that ilk can sometimes become almost immediately dated then right after the election's over. But um, I think I told you, David, that about a year ago, I was, um, even though I'm retired, I still get occasionally asked to do librarian-ish type things. Right. And uh, this uh, group of, uh, woman's group, who I had done uh, um, uh, book groups with and stuff in the past, asked me to lead lead a group, and they wanted to read this book, Barnstorming Ohio. And so uh, I looked at, you know, I read it again, and and uh and what and they all read it and i was really what i was really taken by was how the themes in that book transcend that election i mean there there were still anecdotes stories points of view expressed by the people that you interview that really resonated with this group of women and it was really a great discussion so that we had and That's so great to hear. yeah and so it's you know it's almost like yeah i mean i think that book still has resonance. I think, you know, anyone who thinks, oh, that was a book about that election, uh, it's a part of it, but it's not not at all the entirety. In fact, it's really a, a much bigger themes in it. Oh, so thanks that, yeah, for saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I guess at this point, we have brought you kind of up to date. I'm curious, I, I know you and a few other people are writers that I know, often don't really like to talk publicly too much about what their next project is. So I won't badger you on that, but I assume you're working on something. Um, as we speak, I am uh, finishing the final chapter of a really of a right. new book. Okay. Um, right. I won't say too much about it because I've learned from hard experience <laughs> yeah. that it's not a thing until it's a thing. But, right. <laughs> but it's my first uh, novel, my first book-length fiction, okay. um, Great. historical fiction, and just uh-huh. a teaser. It is... Uh, set uh, in Cleveland against the backdrop of the very, very early days of the punk underground Mm -hmm. in Cleveland. Sounds um, exciting. In the 1970s. Uh, is there yeah, a Nick Doppelganger in this book? Uh, there, there, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, there, there are a number of people from uh, the, the real life story of oh. Cleveland and the larger American story who make their Intriguing. way to it. Um, 
yeah, it might be the only book that includes Peter Lochner, Anita Baker, and Meadowlark Lemon. So. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> I see Nick was is right jotting down his uh, lawyer's name and phone number here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Screaming Jay Hawkins. Should be uh, <laughs> any likeness to persons yeah, living yeah. or dead is purely yeah, coincidental. Nick, Nick no to self. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been From Akron and Beyond. Uh, I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. It's been our pleasure to spend not one but two episodes with David Giffels. I won't call you the Bard of Akron. <laughs> I will just say that you're one of Akron's uh, uh, terrific artists and writers, and uh, it's been a thrill to have you on the show. Thank and, you, uh, And thanks so much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure for me, and thanks for giving me the chance to talk about this stuff. Sure, you bet. Okay. Yeah. And uh, to our audience out there, we'll see you next time.